And so now we read from Erica L. Sanchez's book, I Am Not Your Perfect Mexican Daughter, for my mother. Chapter 1. What surprised me most about seeing my sister dead is the lingering smirk on her face. Her pale lips are turned up ever so slightly, and someone has filled in her patchy eyebrows with a black pencil. The top half of her face is angry, like she's ready to stab someone, and the bottom half is almost smug. This is not the Olga I knew. Olga was as meek and fragile as a baby bird. I wanted her to wear the pretty purple dress that didn't hide her body like all of her other outfits. But Ama chose the bright yellow one with the pink flowers I've always hated. It was so unstylish. So classically Olga. It made her either four or 80 years old. I could never decide which. Her hair is just as bad as the dress. Tight, crunchy curls that remind me of a rich lady's poodle. How cruel to let her look like that. The bruises and gashes on her cheeks are masked with thick coats of cheap foundation, making her face haggard, even though she is, was, only 22. Don't they pump your body full of strange chemicals to prevent your skin from stretching and puckering, to keep your face from resembling a rubber mask? Where did they find this mortician, the flea market? My poor older sister had a special talent for making herself less attractive. She was skinny and had an okay body, but she always managed to make it look like a sack of potatoes. Her face was pale and plain, never a single drop of makeup. What a waste. I'm no fashion icon, far from it, but I do feel strongly against dressing like the elderly. Now she's doing it from beyond the grave, but this time it's not even her fault. Olga never looked or acted like a normal 22-year-old. It made me mad sometimes. Here she was, a grown-ass woman, and all she did was go to work, sit at home with our parents, and take one class each semester at the local community college. Every once in a while, she'd go shopping with Ama or to the movies with her best friend Angie to watch terrible romantic comedies about clumsy but adorable blonde women who fall in love with architects in the streets of New York City. What kind of life is that? Didn't she want more? Didn't she ever want to go out and grab the world by the balls? Ever since I could pick up a pen, I've wanted to become a famous writer. I want to be so successful that people stop me on the street and ask, oh my god, are you Julia Reyes, the best writer who has ever graced this earth? All I know is that I'm going to pack my bags when I graduate and say, peace out, motherfuckers. But not Olga, Saint Olga, the perfect Mexican daughter. Sometimes I wanted to scream at her until something switched on in her brain. But the only time I ever asked her why she didn't move out or go to a real college, she told me to leave her alone in a voice so weak and brittle. I never wanted to ask her again. Now, I'll never know what Olga would have become. Maybe she would have surprised us all. Here I am thinking all of these horrible thoughts about my dead sister. It's easier to be pissed, though. If I stop being angry, I'm afraid I'll fall apart until I'm just a warm mound of flesh on the floor. While I stare at my chewed-up nails and sink deeper into this floppy green couch, I hear on my wailing. She really throws her body into it, too. Mija! Mija! She screams as she practically climbs inside the casket. Apa doesn't even try to pull her off. I can't blame him, because when he tried to calm her down a few hours ago, Ama kicked and filled her arms until she gave him a black eye. I guess he's going to leave her alone for now. She'll tire herself eventually. I've seen babies do that. Papa has been sitting in the back of the room all day, refusing to speak to anyone, staring off into nothing like he always does. Sometimes I think I see his dark mustache quivering, but his eyes stay dry and clear as glass. I want to hug Ama and tell her it's going to be okay, even though it's not and never will be. But I feel almost paralyzed, like I'm underwater and made of lead. When I open my mouth, nothing comes out. Besides Ama, and I haven't had that kind of relationship since I was little. 
We don't hug and say I love you like on TV shows about boring white families who live in two-story houses and talk about their feelings. She and Olga were practically best friends, and I was the odd daughter out. We've been bickering, drifting away from each other for years. I've spent so much of my life trying to avoid Ama because we always end up arguing over stupid, petty things. We once fought about an egg yolk, for instance. True story. Apa and I are the only ones in my family who haven't cried. He just hangs his head and remains silent as a stone. Maybe something is wrong with us. Maybe we're messed up beyond crying. Though my eyes haven't produced tears, I've felt the grief burl in every cell of my body. There are moments that I feel like I might suffocate, as if all my insides are tied into a tight little ball. I haven't taken a crap in almost four days, but I'm not about to tell Ama in the state she's in. I'll just let it build until I explode like a piñata. Ama has always been prettier than Olga, even now, with her swollen eyes and splotchy skin, which is not the way it's supposed to be. Her name is more graceful, too. Amparo Montenegro Reyes. Mothers are not supposed to be more beautiful than their daughters, and daughters are not supposed to die before their mothers. But Ama is more attractive than most people. She hardly has any wrinkles and has these big round eyes that always look sad and wounded. Her long black hair is thick and dark, and her body is still slim, unlike the other moms in the neighborhood who are shaped like upside down pears. Every time I walk down the street with Ama, guys whistle and honk, which makes me wish I carried a slingshot. Ama is rubbing Olga's face and crying softly now. This won't last though. She's always quiet for a few minutes and all of a sudden lets out a moan that makes your soul turn inside out. Now Tia Kuka is rubbing her back and telling her that Olga is with Jesus, that she can finally be in peace. But when was Olga not in peace? This Jesus stuff is all a sack of crap. Once you're dead, you're dead. The only thing that makes sense to me is what Walt Whitman said about death. Look for me under your boot soles. Olga's body will turn to dirt, which will grow into trees, and then someone in the future will step on their fallen leaves. There is no heaven. There is only earth, sky, and the transfer of energy. The idea would almost be beautiful if this weren't such a nightmare. Two ladies waiting in line to see Olga in her casket begin crying. I've never seen them in my life. One is wearing a faded and billowy black dress, and the other wears a saggy skirt that looks like an old curtain. They clasp each other's hands and whisper. Olga and I didn't have much in common, but we did love each other. There are stacks and stacks of pictures to prove it. In Ama's favorite, Olga is braiding my hair. Ama says Olga used to pretend that I was her baby. She'd put me in her toy carriage and sing me songs by Sepeyin, that scary Mexican clown who looks like a rapist but everyone loves for some reason. I would give anything to go back to the day she died and do things differently. I think of all the ways I could have kept Olga from getting on that bus. I've replayed the day over and over in my head so many times and have written down every single detail, but I still can't find the foreshadowing. When someone dies, people always say, they had some sort of premonition, a sinking feeling that something awful was right around the corner. I didn't. The day felt like any other, boring, uneventful, and annoying. We had swimming for gym class that afternoon. I've always hated being in that disgusting Petri dish. The idea of being dunked in everyone's pee and God knows what else is enough to give me a panic attack, and the chlorine makes my skin itch and eyes sting. I always try to get out of it with elaborate and not so elaborate lies. That time, I told the thin-lipped Mrs. Kowalski that I was on my period again, the eighth day in a row. And she said she didn't believe me, that it was impossible for my period to be so long. Of course, I was lying. But who was she to question my menstrual cycle? How intrusive. Do you want to check? I asked. I'd be very happy to provide you with empirical evidence if you want, even though I think you're violating my human rights. 
I regretted it as soon as it came out of my mouth. Maybe I have some sort of condition that keeps me from thinking through what I'm going to say. Sometimes it's word puke spilling out everywhere. That was too much, even for me. But I was in a particularly foul mood and didn't want to deal with anyone. My moods shift like that all the time, even before Olga died. One minute I feel okay, and then all of a sudden my energy plummets for no reason at all. It's hard to explain. Of course, Mrs. Kowalski sent me to the principal's office, and as usual, they wouldn't let me go home until my parents came to pick me up. This happened several times last year. Everyone knows me at the principal's office already. I'm there more often than some of the gangbangers, and it's always for running my mouth when I'm not supposed to. Whenever I enter the office, the secretary, Mrs. Maldonado, rolls her eyes and clucks her tongue. Typically, Ama meets with my principal, Mr. Potter, who tells her what a disrespectful student I am. Then Ama gasps at what I've done and says, Julia, que malcriada, and apologizes to him over and over again in her broken English. She is always apologizing to white people, which makes me feel embarrassed. And then I feel ashamed of my shame. Ama punishes me for one or two weeks, depending on how severe my behavior is, and then a few months later, it happens again. Like I said, I don't know how to control my mouth. Ama tells me, ¿Cómo te gusta la mala vida? And I guess she's right, because I always end up making things more difficult for myself. I used to be a model student, skipped third grade and everything, but now I'm a troublemaker. Olga had taken the bus that day because her car was in the shop to get the brakes replaced. Ama was supposed to pick her up, but because she had to deal with me at school, she couldn't. If I'd shut my mouth, things would have worked out differently. But how was I supposed to know? When Olga got off the bus to transfer to another one across the street, she didn't see that light had already turned green because she was looking at her phone. The bus honked to warn her, but it was too late. Olga stepped into the busy street at the wrong time. She got hit by a semi. Not just hit, though. Smashed. Whenever I think of my sister's crushed organs, I want to scream and fill the flowers until I'm hoarse. Two of the witnesses said that she was smiling right before it happened. It's a miracle that her face was okay enough to have an open casket. She was dead by the time the ambulance arrived. Even though the man driving couldn't have seen her because she was blocked by the bus and the light was green and Olga shouldn't have crossed one of the busiest streets in Chicago with her face in her phone, Ama cursed the driver up and down until she lost her voice. She got really creative too. She had always scolded me for saying the word damn, which is not even a bad word. And here she was telling the driver and God to fuck their mothers and themselves. I just watched her with my mouth hanging open. We all knew it wasn't the driver's fault, but Ama needed someone to accuse. She hasn't blamed me directly, but I can see it in her big sad eyes every time she looks at me. My nosy ants are whispering behind me now. I can feel their eyes latch to the back of my head again. I know they're saying that this is my fault. They've never liked me because they think I'm trouble. When I dyed chunks of my hair bright blue, those drama queens almost needed to be put on stretchers and rushed to the hospital. They act as if I'm some sort of devil child because I don't like to go to church and would rather read books and socialize with them. Why is that a crime though? They're boring. Plus, they have no idea how much I loved my sister. I've had enough of their whispering, so I turn around to give them a dirty look. That's when I see Lorena come in. Thank God, she's the only person who can make me feel better right now. Everyone turns to stare at her in her outrageously high heels, tight black dress, and excessive makeup. Lorena is always drawing attention to herself. Maybe that'll give them something else to gossip about. She hugs me so tight, she nearly cracks my ribs. Her cheap cherry body spray fills my nose and mouth. Ama doesn't like Lorena because she thinks she's wild and slutty, which isn't untrue, but she has been my friend since I was eight and is more loyal than anyone I've ever known. I whisper to her that my tias are talking about me, that they're blaming me for what happened to Olga, that they're making me so angry, I want to smash all the windows with my bare fists. Fuck those nosy viejas.
Lorena says, waving her hand dramatically, shooting them eye daggers. I turn around to see if they've stopped staring when I notice a dark man in the back crying quietly into a cloth handkerchief. He's wearing a gray suit and shiny gold watch. He seems familiar, but I can't place his face. He's probably my uncle or something. My parents are always introducing me to strangers and telling me we're related. There are dozens of people here I've never met. Turn around, he's gone. And Olga's friend Angie comes running in, looking like she was the one hit by a semi. She's beautiful, but damn, is she an ugly crier. Her skin is like a bright pink rag someone has wrung out. As soon as she sees Olga, she starts howling, almost worse than a ma. I wish I knew the right thing to say, but I don't. I never do. Chapter 2 After the funeral, Ama doesn't get out of bed for almost two weeks. She only gets up to go to the bathroom, drink water, and occasionally eat one of those Mexican cookies that tastes like styrofoam. She's been wearing the same loose and frumpy nightgown, and I'm almost positive she hasn't taken a shower this entire time, which is scary, because Ama is the cleanest person I know. Her hair is always washed and neatly braided in her clothes, even when they're old, are patched, ironed, and spotless. When I was seven, Ama found out I hadn't showered for five days, so she dunked me in a scalding hot tub and scrubbed me with a brush until my skin ached. She told me that girls who don't wash their junk get horrible infections, so I never skip showering again. Maybe I'm the one who needs to throw Ama into the tub now. Appa works all day, then sits on the couch with a bottle of beer like usual. In fact, he even sleeps on it now. It's probably molded to his body at this point. He hasn't said much to me this whole time, which is not that different from before. Sometimes he barely says hello. Could it be that my own father hates my guts? He wasn't that much more affectionate toward Olga, but she definitely tried harder. When Apa came home from the factory, she'd bring out his foot bath. She'd kneel down, place his feet gently inside and massage them. They never said a word during this daily ritual. I can't imagine touching him like that. The apartment is a disaster since Ama and Olga were the ones who did all the cleaning. We have roaches, but because Ama mopped every single day, it didn't feel that disgusting. Now the dirty dishes are piled high and the kitchen table is covered with crumbs. The roaches are probably rejoicing. And the bathroom? It should be burned to the ground. I know I should clean, but whenever I look at the mess, I think, what's the point? Nothing feels like it has a point anymore. I don't want to bother my parents because they have enough to worry about, but I'm so hungry and tired of eating nothing but tortillas and eggs. A few days ago, I tried to make beans, but they never softened. Even though I boiled them for three hours, I nearly cracked my teeth on one. I had to throw away the whole pot, which is a sin, according to Amma. I hope my aunts bring over more food. This is the only time I wish I would have let my mother teach me how to cook. But I hate the way she hovers over me and criticizes my every move. I'd rather live in the streets than be a submissive Mexican wife who spends all day cooking and cleaning. Apa hasn't eaten much either. The other day, he brought home a brick of chihuahua cheese and a stack of tortillas. So we ate quesadillas for several days, but we've run out now. Yesterday I got desperate and boiled some old potatoes and ate them with nothing but salt and pepper. We didn't even have butter. It's gone so bad that I've started daydreaming about dancing hamburgers. A slice of pizza could probably make me weep with happiness. I peek inside my parents' bedroom and the sour smell nearly knocks me over. A mix of unwashed hair, gas, and sweat. Ama, I whisper. No answer. Ama. I say again louder, still nothing. I finally step inside the room completely. The smell is so awful that I have to breathe through my mouth. I wonder if Ama is ever going back to work. What if the rich asshole she cleans for decide to fire her? Now that Olga is gone and can't pitch in, what are we going to do? I'm not old enough to get a job. Ama! I finally yell. I turn on the light. She gasps, what? What do you want? She says, her voice blurry with sleep. She covers her eyes with her hands. Are you okay? Yes, I'm fine. Please leave me alone. I want to rest. You haven't eaten or taken a shower in a really long time. 
How do you know? Are you here watching me every hour of the day? Your tia came by and gave me soup yesterday. I'm fine. It smells terrible in here. I'm starting to get worried. How can you live like this? Funny how my slob of a daughter is suddenly concerned with cleanliness. When have you ever cared about that before? Ama has always given me attitude for my messiness, but this is unlike her. Olga was the clean one, she adds, in case it didn't sting enough. She has compared me to my sister every single day of my life. So why should I expect that to change now that she's dead? Olga's gone now. All you have is me. Sorry. Silence. I want Ama to tell me that she loves me and that we'll get through this together, but she doesn't. I stand there like a dope, waiting and waiting for her to say something that will make me feel better. When I realize she's not going to, I dig through her wallet on the dresser, take out a $5 bill, and slam the door. After searching every crevice of my room, I manage to find $4.75 in change. I'll be able to buy three tacos and a large horchata, which isn't much, but it will do. If I have to eat one more plain tortilla or boiled potato, I swear I'll cry. I slip out the back door to avoid Afa in the living room, not that he'd even ask or notice. Now I have a ghost father and ghost sister. The taco place is bright with fluorescent lighting and smells like grease and pine saw. I've never eaten alone at a restaurant and it makes me nervous. I can feel everyone watching me. They probably think I'm a loser for eating alone. The waitress gives me a funny look too. I bet she thinks I'm not going to tip her, but I'll prove her wrong. I may be young, but I'm not dumb. I order two tacos de asada and one al pastor with extra limes. The smell of fried meat and grilled onion makes my mouth water. When the tacos arrive, I try to eat them slowly, but end up inhaling them with desperation. Not only am I bad at cooking, I'm bad at being hungry. I'm always convinced I'm going to faint when my stomach starts to grumble. Each bite of the taco shoots a rush of pleasure through my body. I guzzle the bucket-sized horchata until I feel sick. When I get back home, Amaya's in the kitchen with a towel wrapped around her head drinking tea. She's freshly showered and smells like fake roses. She's finally ditched her nightgown and is wearing her white robe. The sudden sight of her clean and functioning almost scares me. She doesn't ask me where I've been, which has never, ever happened. She always wants to know where I am and who I'm with. She asks a million questions about my friend's parents, what part of Mexico they're from, what church they go to, where they work, but today, nothing. I wonder if she can smell the meat and onion in my clothes and hair. I can usually predict what Ama is going to say, but this time, I'm not at all prepared. She takes a loud slurp of her tea, which always, always gets on my nerves, and tells me I'm going to have a quinceañera. My heart stops. Wait, what? A party. Don't you want a nice party? My sister just died, and you want to throw me a party? I'm already 15. I must be dreaming. I never got to give Olga a quinceañera. It's something I'll always regret. So you're going to use me to make yourself feel better? Ay, Julia, what is wrong with you? What kind of girl wouldn't want to celebrate her 15th birthday? So ungrateful, she shakes her head. Plenty is wrong with me, and she knows it. But I don't want one. You can't make me. Ama tightens her robe. That's too bad. It's a waste of money. I bet Olga would have wanted you to help me with college instead. You don't know anything about what Olga would have wanted, she says, and takes another slurp of her tea. Apa is watching the news in the living room. I can hear the news anchor say something about a mass grave found in Mexico. He always turns the volume way up when Ama and I are arguing, as if he's trying to drown us out. This doesn't make any sense. I'm already 15. Who's ever heard of such a thing? I start pulling on my hair, which is what I do when I feel panicky. We'll have it in May in the church basement. I already called the priest. It'll be available by then, she says, matter-of-factly. May, are you joking? I turned 16 in July. Why would you do that? You can't call that a quinceañera. I start pacing. I feel short of breath. You'll still be 15, won't you? Yeah, but that's not the point. This is so stupid. I shake my head and look at the ground. 
The point is having a nice party with your family. But my family doesn't even like me. And I don't want to wear a big ugly dress. And the dancing, oh my god, the dancing? The thought of spinning in circles in front of all my idiot cousins makes me want to run away from home and join the circus. What are you talking about? Everyone loves you. Don't be so dramatic. No, they don't. They all think I'm weird. And you know that. I stare at the cheap replica of the Last Supper next to the cabinets. It's so old that Jesus and his posse are starting to fade into light yellows and greens. That's not true. A ma furrows her brow. Well, either way, you can't call it a quinceañera. Yes, I can. It's tradition. A ma's jaw tightens and her eyes narrow in a way that tells me I'm not going to win. Where are you going to get the money? Don't worry about it. How can I not worry? That's all you ever talk about. I said, it's not your problem. Do you understand? Ama's voice gets quiet, which is even scarier than when she yells. This fucking sucks, I say, and kick the stove so hard the pan rattles. Watch your mouth, or I'll slap you so hard I'll break your teeth. Something tells me she's not exaggerating. When I can't sleep, I crawl into Olga's bed. Last week, Ama told me to never, ever go inside her room, but I can't help it. I slip in there after my parents have gone to bed and then wake up before they do. I think Ama wants to keep the room exactly as Olga left it. Maybe she wants to pretend that she's still alive, that one day she'll come home from work and everything will be normal again. If Ama knew that I touched Olga's things, she'd probably never forgive me. She'd probably ship me to Mexico, one of her favorite threats, as if that would solve any of my problems. My sister's bed still smells like her, fabric softener, lavender lotion, and her warm and sweet human scent. I can't describe. Olga dressed ugly, but smelled like a meadow. I toss and turn for a long time. Tonight my mind won't shut off. I can't stop thinking about the chemistry test I failed yesterday, 24%, which is the worst grade I've received. Even an intellectually stunted monkey could get a better score. I already hated chemistry, but since Olga died, I haven't been able to concentrate. Sometimes I look at my books and tests and the words all blur and swirl together. If I keep going like this, I'll never get into college. I'll end up working in a factory, marry some loser and have his ugly children. After lying in bed for hours, I turn on the lamp and try to read. I've read The Awakening a million times, but I find it comforting. My favorite character is a lady in black who follows Edna and Robert everywhere. I also love the book because I'm so much like Edna. Nothing satisfies me. Nothing makes me happy. I want too much out of life. I want to take, take it in my hands and squeeze and twist as much as I can from it. And it's never enough. I read the same sentence over and over again and lay the book on my stomach. I stare at the light purple walls and remember the happy times I had with my sister before we started to flutter away from each other. There's a picture on her dresser of both of us in Mexico. Our parents used to send us every summer, but it's been years since we've been there. Ama and Apa haven't been able to go back because they're still illegal. The two of us are in front of Mama Jacinta's house. We're both squinting and smiling in the sun, and Olga's arm is around my neck so tight that it is almost as if she's choking me. I remember that day so clearly. We swam in the river for hours, then ate Hawaiian hamburgers from the cart near the park. Most of my childhood sucked, but our summers in Mexico were different. We'd get to stay up all night and play kick the can in the streets until we were filthy and exhausted. Here, we would have been hit by stray bullets. Sometimes we'd get to ride my great uncle's beautiful black horses and Mama Jacinta would spoil us with food, no matter how silly our cravings were. Once she even made us a pizza with stinky ranchero cheese. Behind our picture is a poster of Mana, the terrible Mexican rock band that I hate because all their songs are about weeping angels and something equally lame. On the opposite wall is her high school graduation picture. Olga was a good student, so I could never understand why she didn't want to go to a real college. I've been dreaming of going since I was little. I know I'm smart. That's why they skipped me ahead a year. I was bored out of my skull in class. Now I get mostly B's with a sprinkle of C's, except for English. 
I always get A's in English. My mind usually wanders and gets lost in a tangle of worries. As I look around the room, I wonder who my sister was. I lived with her my whole life, and now I feel like I didn't know her at all. Olga was a perfect daughter, cooked, cleaned, and never stayed out late. Sometimes I wondered if she'd live with my parents forever like that sap tita from Like Water for Chocolate. Ugh, such a terrible book. Olga loved her job, even though she was only a receptionist. What could be so fulfilling about filing and answering phones? The stuffed animals on the dresser makes me sad. I mean, I know they're inanimate objects. I'm not an idiot. But I imagine them all melancholic, waiting for my sister to come back. Olga loved babies the color pink and peanut butter cups. She always covered her mouth when she laughed because of her snaggle tooth. She was a good listener, unlike me. She never, ever interrupted. She was also an excellent cook. In fact, her enchiladas were better than Amma's, but I've never said that out loud. I know Amma loves me and has always has, but Olga has always been her favorite. Ever since I was a little kid, I've questioned everything, which drove both my parents insane. Even when I try to be good, I couldn't. It's as if it were physically impossible for me, as if I were allergic to rules. Things just got worse and worse as I got older. Stuff that's sexist, for example, makes me crazy. Once I ruined Thanksgiving by going on a rant about the women having to cook all day while the men just sat around scratching their butts. Amma said I embarrassed her in front of the whole family, that I couldn't change the way things have always been. I probably should have let it go after a while, but I stand by what I said. Amaya and I also argue about religion all the time. I told her that the Catholic Church hates women because it wants us to be weak and ignorant. It was right after the time our priest said, I swear to God, that women should obey their husbands. He literally used the word obey. I gasped and looked around in disbelief to see if anyone else was as angry as I was, but no, I was the only one. I poked Olga in the ribs and whispered, can you believe this shit? But she just told me to be quiet and listen to the sermon. Amma said I was disrespectful, huerca, that how could the church hate women when we worship La Virgen de Guadalupe? You can't ever win an argument with her, so why do I bother? Stuff like that made us hate each other, and Olga was always taking her side. They looked alike too. They're both pale and thin with straight black hair, and I'm chubby, short and dark like a ba. I'm not like super fat or anything, but I have thick legs and my stomach is definitely not flat. Oh, and my boobs are much too big for my body. Two pendulous burdens I've been lugging around since I was 13. I'm also the only one in the family who wears glasses. I'm practically blind. If I went out into the world with naked eyeballs, I'd probably be robbed, run over by a car, or mauled by animals. I read for a little while longer, then try to go to sleep, but I can't. I stay wide awake for what feels like hours. When I hear birds beginning to chirp, I get so angry I tug at the sheets and arrange the pillow over and over again. I feel something inside it press my cheek. For a second, I think it's a feather. But then I remember I'm not living in the 1800s. I sift through the pillowcase and pull out a folded piece of paper. It's a sticky note with the name of a prescription, Lexafron. Olga probably got it from the pharmaceutical people who always visited her office. On the back it says, I love you. I stare at it for a minute, not understanding. Why the hell is this in my sister's pillow? My mind is leaping, my thoughts doing somersaults and backflips. Olga only had one boyfriend who I knew of, Pedro, a skinny little guy who looked like an aardvark, but that was years ago. I seriously don't know what she, was in, what she saw in him, because not only was he ugly, he had the personality of a boiled potato. Even though I was only 10, I often wondered what was going on in that little brain of his. Pedro was just as shy as Olga, so I don't know what they talked about. When he came to our family parties, my uncles would give him a hard time for being such a dork. I remember uh, Tio Cayetano trying to give him a shot of tequila once, and Pedro just shaking his head no. Most of the time, he'd pick Olga up on Friday nights and take her to dinner. Their favorite place was Red Lobster. 
Once they even went to Great America. How riveting. They dated for a year until he and his family moved back to Mexico. Oh my God, who does that? That was the last I knew about Olga's love life. I tiptoed to her closet and started digging through her things as quietly as possible. One box is filled with photos from school. Most of them are of Olga and her best friends during science fairs, field trips, and birth parties. She was in the science club at school and for some reason felt the need to document every single moment. I mean, there's even a picture of her holding a microscope. Jesus, my sister was boring. I keep sifting through the box when I fill some clothes. I can't be prepared for what I pull out. Five pairs of silk and lace thongs. Sexy lady underwear, the kind I imagine a very expensive hooker might buy. At the very bottom, I find skimpy lingerie. I have no idea what it's called, a nighty, a negligee, a teddy, such stupid names for things that are supposed to be sexy. Why would Olga have this in her closet? Why would she subject herself to those, these forever wedgies when she didn't even have a boyfriend? Was this what she wore under her senior citizen ensembles? Olga must have done a good job washing them in secret because if Amma had found them in the laundry, she would have flipped the hell out. I have to find her laptop now. I have two hours until my parents wake up. I look everywhere, even the places I already searched. Finally, when I'm so tired I'm about to give up, I think to check the most obvious place of all, under her mattress, and there it is, duh. I know guessing a password is probably impossible, but I have to make an effort. I try a few things, her favorite food, our parents' hometown, Los Ojos, our address, her birthday, and even one, two, three, four, five, which only a complete moron would use. Oh, who am I kidding? This is impossible. I go back to her dresser. There has to be something else in there. Her drunk drawer is full of pens, paper clips, scraps of paper, receipts, old notebooks, nothing even remotely interesting. As I consider going back to sleep, I find an envelope under a pile of note cards. It feels like there's a credit card inside, but it's not. It's a hotel key, the Continental, it says. Except for our trips to Mexico, Olga has never, ever slept anywhere else. Why would she need a hotel key? Angie works at a hotel, but it's called something else. The, the Skyline, I think. I hear someone open a door. Maybe a ma or a ba got up to pee. I flick off the lights as quickly as possible and try not to move or breathe. If Amma catches me, she'll make sure I never get in here again. The next thing I know, I wake up to the sound of someone in the kitchen. My pillow is wet. I must have fallen asleep before I could set an alarm on my phone. Holy shit, Amma is going to kill me. I make Olga's bed as fast as I can and press my ear to the door to make sure no one is near when I sneak back into my room. Amma must have been wearing ninja shoes because when I open the door, there she is with her hands on her hips. Chapter 3 I didn't know how things could get any worse at home, but apparently they can. The apartment feels like the play The House of Bernarda Alba, but much less interesting. Just like the crazy and grieving mother, Amma keeps all the blinds and curtains drawn, which makes our cramped apartment even more stuffy and depressing. Because of my punishment for going into Olga's room, all I can do is read, draw, and write in my journal. Amma also took away my phone. I can't even close my bedroom door because she opens it as soon as I do. When I tell her I need privacy, she laughs and tells me I've become too Americanized. Privacy. I never had any privacy when I was a girl. You kids here think you can do whatever you want, she says. I don't even know what she thinks I might do if I'm alone in my room. There's no way I try touching myself with her yelling and lurking all the time. I don't bother looking out the window because all I can see is the building next door. And now I can't go into Olga's room, not even at night when they're sleeping, because I might install the lock and I can't find the key. I've looked everywhere. As soon as I can bust out of here, I'm going to the Continental Hotel to see if I can find anything about Olga. I've tried calling Angie about a million times from a landline and she still hasn't called me back. She has to know something. I usually go inside my closet to cry so my parents don't hear me, 
other times i just lie on my bed and stare at the ceiling imagining the kind of life i want to have when i get older i picture myself at the top of the eiffel tower climbing pyramids in egypt dancing in the streets in spain riding in a boat in venice and walking on the great wall of china in these dreams i'm a famous writer who wears flamboyant scarves and travels all around the world meeting fascinating people no one tells me what to do i go wherever i want and do whatever i please then i realize that i'm still in my tiny bedroom and can't even go outside it's like a living death i almost envy olga which i know is completely fucked up if i tell a ma that i'm bored she tells me to pick up a mop and start cleaning she doesn't believe in boredom when there's so much to do around the house as if cleaning the apartment were as entertaining as a day at the beach when she says stuff like this i feel the anger bubble in my guts sometimes i love her and sometimes i hate her mostly i feel a combination of both i know it's wrong to hate your parents especially when your sister is dead but i can't help it so i keep it in myself and the resentment grows through me like weeds i thought deaths were supposed to bring people together but i guess that's just what happens on tv i wonder if other people feel this way i asked lorena once but she said no how could i possibly hate my own mother what was wrong with me but that's probably because her mom lets her do whatever the hell she wants i don't like most of my teachers because they're as interesting as buckets of rocks but english with mr ingman is always fun there's something about mr ingman that i liked right away he looks like a dorky suburban dad but his eyes are friendly and his weird jagged laugh is kind of funny and he treats us like we're adults like he actually cares about what we think and feel most teachers talk down to us as if we're a bunch of immature dummies who don't know anything about anything i don't know if anyone's told mr ingman about my dead sister because he doesn't look at me like he pities me as soon as we sit down today mr ingman makes us write down our favorite word and says we'll have to explain it to the rest of the class i've loved words since i learned how to read but i've never thought about my favorite ones how can you choose just one i don't know why such a simple task makes me so nervous it takes me a few minutes to come up with anything then i can't stop dusk serenity flesh oblivious vespers serendipitous kaleidoscope dazzle wisteria hieroglyph sputter by the time mr ingman gets to me i finally decide on wisteria so what's yours julia mr ingman nods towards me he always says my name exactly how i pronounce it the spanish way yes ah uh, well um i had a lot of words but in the end i picked wisteria what do you like about that word mr ingman sits on his desk and leans forward i don't know it's a flower and it it just sounds beautiful and it rhymes with hysteria which i think is kind of cool and maybe this sounds weird but when i say it i like the way it feels in my mouth i regret that last part because all the guys start laughing i should have known mr ingman shakes his head come on guys let's show julia some respect I expect you all to be kind to each other in this class. If you can't do that, I'll ask you to leave, understand? The class quiets down. After we get through everyone, Mr. Ingman asks us why he made us do this exercise. A few people shrug, but no one says anything. The words you choose can tell us a lot about yourself, he says. In this class, I want you to learn to appreciate, wait, no, I want you to love language. Not only will I expect you to read difficult texts and learn how to analyze them in smart and surprising ways, I expect you to learn hundreds of new words. See? I'm teaching you standard English, which is the language of power. What does that mean? Mr. Ingman raises his eyebrows and looks around the room. Anyone? The room is silent. I want to answer, but I'm too embarrassed. I see Leslie smirk next to me. What a jerk. She always looks like she's just sniffed a dirty diaper. It means that you will learn to speak and write in a way that will give you authority. Does that mean that the way you speak in your neighborhood is wrong? 
that slang is bad, that you can't say on fleek or whatever you kids are saying these days? Absolutely not. That form of speaking is often fun, inventive, and creative. But would it be helpful to speak that way in a job interview? Unfortunately not. I want you to think about these things. I want you to think about words in a way you've never done before. I want you to leave this class with the tools to compete with kids in the suburbs because they're just as capable, just as smart. After Mr. Ingman gives us a short lesson on the importance of American literature, the bell rings. This is definitely my favorite class. On Saturday morning, Ama is making flour tortillas. I can smell the dough and hear the rolling pin from my bedroom when I wake up. Sometimes Ama lies in bed all day, and other times she's in a cooking and cleaning frenzy. It's impossible to predict. I know she's going to make me help her, so I stay in bed reading until she forces me to get up. Get up, huevona! I hear her yelling from the other room. Ama calls me huevona all the time. She says I don't have the right to be tired because I don't work cleaning houses all day like she does. I guess she has a point, but it's a weird thing to call a girl if you really think about it. Huevos means eggs, so it means that your eggs, balls, are so big that they drag you down and make you lazy. Telling a girl her balls are too heavy is bizarre, but I never point this out because I know it will piss her off. After I brush my teeth and wash my face, I go to the kitchen. Ama has already covered the table and counters with rolled out tortillas. She's bent over the table, stretching a little ball of dough, dough into a perfect circle. Put on an apron and start heating these up, Ama says, pointing to the tortillas scattered throughout the kitchen. How do I know when they're done? You just know. I don't know what that means. What kind of girl doesn't know when a tortilla is done? She looks irritated already. Me, I don't. Please, just tell me. You'll figure it out. It's common sense. I study the tortillas as they heat on the comal and try to flip them before they burn. When I turn the first one, I see that I've left it too long. That side is almost burnt. Ama tells me that the second one is too pale, that I have to leave it on longer. But when I do, it gets too crisp. When I burn the third one completely, Ama sighs and tells me to roll them out instead while she heats them. I take her rolling pin and try my best to shape the little balls into circles. Most of them end up in weird shapes, no matter how much I try to fix them. That one looks like a chancla, Ama says, looking at my worst one. It's not perfect, but it doesn't look like a slipper, Jesus. I feel myself grow more and more frustrated. I take a deep breath. I don't want to fight with her because I heard her crying in their bedroom last night. They have to be perfect. Why? We're just going to eat them. Why does it matter if they're not in perfect shape? If you're going to do something, you have to do it right, or else you shouldn't do it at all, Ama says, turning back to the stove. Olga's were always so nice and round. I don't care about Olga's tortillas, I say, throwing off my apron. I've had enough. I don't care about any of this crap. I don't see the point of going through all this trouble when we can buy them at the store. Get back here. Ama yells after me. What kind of woman are you going to be if you can't even make a tortilla? After two weeks of no TV, no phone, and no going out whatsoever, Ama says maybe she'll end my punishment today. Little does she know that I'm going to the Continental after school. I'm tired of waiting for permission to go anywhere, and something about Olga is driving me crazy. Maybe I can convince Lorena to go with me. I put on bright red lipstick, my favorite black dress, red fishnets, and black Chuck Taylors. I flat iron my hair until it falls straight down my back. I don't even care that I look kind of fat or have a giant pipple throbbing on my chin. I'm going to try my best to have a good day. Well, as good as it, as it can be when your sister is dead and you feel like you might lose your mind at any moment. When Ama sees me come out of my room, she makes the sign of the cross and doesn't say anything. That's what she does when she hates what I'm wearing, or I say something weird, which is always. I put the leather journal Olga gave me for Christmas in my backpack. It was one of the most beautiful gifts I've ever received. I guess even when it didn't seem like it, Olga was always paying attention. 
When Ahmad drops me off at school, she kisses me on the cheek and reminds me that we have to start looking for a dress, that I can't show up to my party looking like, a worship sa like I worship Satan. Lorena meets me at my locker and gives me a hug before class. Sometimes I don't know how Lorena and I are still best friends. We're so different and look like complete opposites. People even look at us funny when they see us together. She likes spandex and bright and crazy patterns and colors. She wears leggings as pants. I prefer band t-shirts, jeans, and dark dresses. Most of the clothes in my closet are black, gray, or red. When I started listening to New Wave and Indie, Lorena got into hip hop and R&B. We always argue about music and everything else for that matter. But I've known her forever and we understand each other in a weird way I can't describe. She can tell what I'm thinking just by looking at me. Lorena is ghetto, loud, and acts ignorant as hell sometimes, but I love her. She'll fight anyone who even looks at me funny. One time, Fabiola, a girl we've known since grade school, made fun of my pants, and Lorena knocked her desk over and told her she looked like a scared chihuahua. The bell rings before I can ask Lorena to go downtown with me after school. I run to algebra before I'm late. Not only do I hate math with every fiber of my being, I suspect my teacher, Mr. Simmons, is a racist Republican. He has a handlebar mustache and his desk is covered with American flags. He even has a tiny Confederate one he probably thinks we don't notice. What kind of person would have something like that? He also has a dumb Ronald Reagan quote about jelly beans taped to the wall, which is another obvious clue. You can tell a lot about a fellow's character by the way he eats his jelly beans. What does that even mean? How exactly do people eat jelly beans differently? Is that supposed to be deep or something? No one seems to notice or care about these kinds of things, though. I tried to explain it to Lorena, but she just shrugged and said, white people. While Mr. Simmons goes on and on about integers, I work on a poem in my journal. I only have a couple of pages left. Red ribbons unraveling with the noise of my chaos. A light beating like a drum. I opened my wings and took a swim in a warm euphoric dream of hands pressed to faces open to the mad dancing and combusted into a new constellation. The dream too warm for the flesh, too rough for the soft touch of fingertips, holding my universe in a single grasp. Everything sank, falling to the ground, became blue. The sunsets raining behind me like a monsoon. As I'm daydreaming about more images for my poem, Mr. Simmons calls on me, of course. He probably noticed my hatred for him pulsing around me. Julia, what is the answer to problem four? He takes his glasses off and squints at me. He says my name the wrong way, Julia. Even though I already told him how to pronounce it, Ama has never let me say it the English way. She says she's the one who named me and that people can't go around changing it for their own convenience. We agree on that at least. It's not like it's hard to pronounce. I'm sorry, I don't know, I tell Mr. Simmons. Were you paying attention? No, I wasn't, sorry. And why not? My face feels hot. Everyone is watching me, waiting for my humiliation like vultures. Why can't he just back off? Look, I said I was sorry. I don't know what else to tell you. Mr. Simmons is really pissed now. I want you to come to the board and solve the problem, he says, pointing at me. I guess he was never taught that it's impolite to point at people. I want to get all Bartleby about it. Tell him I don't fucking feel like it, but I know I shouldn't. I've gotten in enough trouble lately. But why does he have to pick on me? Doesn't he know my sister is dead? My heart is racing and I can feel a thick pulse in my left cheek. I wonder if my face is twitching. No. What did you say to me? I said no. Now Mr. Simmons is pink as ham. His hands are on his hips and he looks as though he wants to bash my skull. Before he says anything else, I shove my stuff into my backpack and run out the door. I can't deal with this today. Get back here right now, young lady, he yells after me, but I keep going. I can hear everyone screaming, laughing, and clapping as I walk out the door. Damn, son, I hear Marcos yell. Oh, hell no. She told you. I think that's Jorge, which makes me almost forgive him for having a rat tail. The sky is clear, a blue so bright and beautiful that it hurts to look at it. 
Maybe I should have waited until the end of the day to see if I could convince Lorena to go with me. But there's no way I'm going back inside now. The birds are carrying on and the streets smell like frying chorizo. Cars are honking. Men and women are selling fruit and corn from carts. Mexican music is blaring from every direction. Most of the time, I hate walking through my neighborhood because of the gangbangers and guys whistling from their cars. But today, nobody even looks at me. I know I shouldn't have left school, but Ama is always talking about how it's a sin to waste this and that, and it feels like a sin to waste a day like this. Besides, now I don't have to wait all day to go to the Continental. As I walk to the bus, I watch a helicopter fly toward downtown until it disappears into a tiny black speck. I can see the hazy skyline in the distance. As long as I can find the Sears Tower, I know I can't get lost. A green balloon floats past a power line, then gets tangled in a tree. I remember a movie I watched in first grade about a red balloon that chased a French boy throughout the streets of Paris. I imagine this balloon coming loose and chasing a little Mexican girl throughout the streets of Chicago. I walk into the most unappetizing diner in the whole entire city. The counters are avocado green and most of the stools are torn. Even the windows look greasy. It makes me feel like I went into a time machine. It reminds me of the painting Nighthawks, but even more depressing. I'm not sure where I am exactly. I think I'm near the South Loop. I sit down at the counter and the waitress asks me what I'll have in a thick European accent. Maybe she's Polish or from one of those other countries in Eastern Europe. I can't tell exactly. She looks tired, but pretty in a way that doesn't call too much attention to herself. In a way that doesn't say, hey, hey, look at me. I only have $8.58 in my pocket and I still have to get back on the bus or train. So I have to choose carefully. What I really want is this meal called the hobo which is made of eggs, hash browns, cheese, and bacon. Practically everything I love. But it's $7.99. I won't have enough left to get back home. I order a cheese danish and a cup of coffee, even though the smell of bacon makes my mouth drip. I read the newspaper on the counter while I drink my coffee, which is so awful I can barely stomach it. It tastes as if they boiled old socks and dumped the liquid into a coffee pot, but I gulp it down anyway because I'm not about to waste my $2. And the Danish is still, of course. I should have seen that coming. I scoop out the cheese and eat it with my finger. Shouldn't you be in school? The waitress asks as she refills my mug. Yeah, I should be, but one of my teachers was being a total jerk. Hmm. She raises an eyebrow. She seems suspicious. He was, I swear. What did he do? He called on me to solve a problem on the board. I didn't know the answer, but he kept insisting. It was so embarrassing. I realize how stupid this sounds when I say it out loud. That doesn't sound too bad, she says. Yeah, I guess it doesn't, huh? We both laugh. Well, I think you should probably go back before you get in trouble, she smiles. My sister is dead, I blurt out. What? She asks as if she's misheard. She died last month. I can't concentrate. I guess that's the real reason I left. Oh no, she says her pretty face now sad and severe. Why did I tell her this? It's not her problem. You poor girl, I'm so sorry. Thank you, I say, still not knowing why I just told her about Olga. She squeezes my hand, then walks to a table behind me. I write in my journal for a little while and try to figure out what to do next. Might as well make a day of it since I'm already going downtown. Whatever I do has to be free or close to it or else I'll have to walk home. After some brainstorming and doodling, I decide on the Art Institute, which is one of my favorite places in the whole world. Well, in Chicago. I haven't seen much of the world yet. They have, suggest they have a suggested donation, but I never pay it. Keyword suggested. When I ask the waitress for my bill, she tells me someone's already paid for me. What? Who? Wait, I don't understand. The man who was sitting over there. She points to an empty stool at the end of the counter. He heard you were having a bad day. I can't believe it. Why would somebody do something like that without asking for anything in return? He didn't even hit on me or stare at my boobs or wait around for me to thank him. I run out to the street to find him, but it's too late. He's gone. I take out my notebook and stare at the address for the Continental. I'm not very good with directions, but I think I can probably figure it out without a map. I walk northwest. It's not that hard when you know where the lake is. 
The buildings are blocking the sun, so it's starting to feel cold. I wish I would have brought a jacket. A homeless man with no legs screams in front of a Starbucks. I think he's drunk because I can't understand what he's saying. Something about a llama. A mother and daughter brush past me with two giant American girl bags. I've heard those dolls cost hundreds and hundreds of dollars. I can't wait until I have enough money to buy whatever the hell I want without worrying about every single penny. I, however, would never spend it on something as stupid as a doll. The Continental is small but lavish. Lots of blue and off-white. It's called a boutique hotel, whatever the hell that means. The woman at the front desk hangs up the phone when I approach her. Can I help you, miss? Her hair is drawn into a slick, tiny, tight ponytail that looks like it hurts, and her perfume smells like a dusty flower in a summer twilight. Did you ever see this girl come in here? She was my sister. I give her a picture of Olga at Tia Cuca's barbecue a month before she died. She's holding a plate of food and smiling with her eyes closed. I figured it was best to use the most recent one I could find. I'm sorry, but we're not allowed to give any information about our guest. She smiles apologetically. I see a tiny smear of pink lipstick on her teeth, but she's dead. She winces and shakes her head. I'm so sorry. Can you at least tell me if you've seen her? Again, I'm so sorry for your loss, but I can't. It's against our policy, sweetheart. Why would a policy matter if she's dead? Can you just look up her name, Olga Reyes, please? The only people we're allowed to give information to is the police. Fuck, I mutter under my breath. I know it's not her fault, but I'm so frustrated. Okay, well, can you at least tell me if this hotel is connected to the skyline? Are they owned by the same company? Yes, they're a part of the same conglomerate. Why do you ask? Thanks. I walk out the door without bothering to explain. Before entering the museum, I take a walk around the gardens outside. Everyone is desperately trying to hang on to the sunshine, enjoying the unexpected warmth before the winter takes a cold gray cap on the city crap on the city and makes us all miserable again though the trees are changing colors flowers are still in bloom and there are bees everywhere everything is so perfect i wish i could keep it in a jar a young woman in a flower dress is breastfeeding her baby a man with long gray hair is lying on a bench with his head on his wife's lap a couple is making out against a tree. For a split second, my mind tricks me into believing this girl is Olga because they have the same long ponytail, skinny body, and flat butt. But when she turns around, she looks nothing like my sister. When I tell the woman at the counter that I will pay zero dollars instead of the suggested donation, she eyeballs me as if I were some sort of criminal. Don't we all have a right to art? Are you trying to keep me from an education? That seems very bourgeoisie if you ask me. I learned that word in history class last year and try to use it whenever it's appropriate because Mr. Ingman always tells us that language is power. The woman just sighs, rolls her eyes, and hands me the ticket. She probably hates her job. I know I would. I walk over to my favorite painting, Judith Slane Holofernes. We learned about the artist Artemisia Gentilici in art class last year. My teacher, Ms. Schwartz, told us something bad happened to her, but wouldn't tell us what, so I looked it up after class. It turns out that her painting teacher raped her when she was 17. What a scumbag. Almost all the Renaissance and Baroque paintings we studied in the class were of baby Jesus, which is not very interesting. So when I saw Artemisia Gentilici's paintings of biblical women killing all those horrible men, my heart trembled. She was such a badass. Every time I see Judith slaying Holofernes, I notice something new. That's what's so great about art and poetry. Right when you think you get it, you see something else. You can find a million hitting me meanings. What I love most about the paintings is that Judith and her maid are slicing off the man's head, but they don't even look scared. They're totally casual, as if they're just washing dishes or something. I wonder if that's how it really happened. When Miss Schwartz said, that one of her paintings was at our museum, I decided I needed to see it right away. This is my fourth time this year. I love art almost as much as I love books. 
It's hard to explain the way I feel when I see a beautiful painting. It's a combination of scared, happy, excited, and sad all at once, like a soft light that glows in my chest and stomach for a few seconds. Sometimes it takes my breath away, which I didn't know was a real thing until I stood in front of this painting. I used to think it was just some saying in a pop song about stupid people in love. I had a similar feeling when I read an Emily Dickinson poem. I was too excited and threw my book across the room. It was so good that it made me angry. People would think I'm nuts if I try to explain it to them, so I don't. I crouched down to get a better look at the bottom part, which I never paid much attention to before. The blood is dripping on the white sheet, and the fibers of the silk are so delicately paint painted that it's hard to believe they aren't real. I can't get enough of this place. I can be here forever and ever studying all the art and walking up and down the dramatic marble staircases. I love the thorn miniature rooms too. I can spend hours imagining a tiny version of myself living in those fancy little houses. I always have to come to the museum alone though because no one will ever join me. I tried dragging Lorena once, but she just laughed and called me a nerd. I suppose I can't argue with that. I asked Olga one time, but she was going shopping with Angie that day. As I wander around, I find a painting I've never noticed before. Anna Maria Dashwood, later Marchioness of Eli by Sir Thomas Lawrence. I gasp when I see the woman's face because my sister's eyes are staring back at me. I never paid attention to that expression before, neither joyous nor somber, but as if she were trying to tell me something. I walk around and around and lose track of time. I look at my favorite paintings again, the old guitarist by Pablo Picasso, the cybernetic lobster telephone by Salvador Dalí, and the one made of dots by George Seurat. Every time I see it, I promise myself I'll go to Paris someday. I'll roam through the city by myself eating cheese until I burst. It's rush hour when I finally get on the train to go back home. The bus is too unreliable at this time. All the men and women in suits are all sweaty and tired. If I end up being an office lady who wears slacks and changes into white sneakers to walk home from the train, I'll just jump off a skyscraper. The train is crammed with people, but I find a window seat facing backward next to a man in a filthy coat who smiles and says, Good evening, when I sit down. He smells like pee, but at least he has good manners. I take out my journal to make some notes. I love to watch the city from above. The graffiti on factories, the honking cars, the old buildings with shattered windows, everyone in a hurry. It's exciting to see all the movement and energy, even though I want to move far away from here. Moments like these make me love Chicago. A couple of black kids near the doors start beatboxing, which makes a man frown and shake his head. I think it sounds amazing, though I wonder how they can make that kind of music with their mouths. How can they sound exactly like machines? I go back to the poem I started in Mr. Simmons' class. When a woman with a burned face makes her way through the crowded aisle, asking everyone to spare some change. When she gets closer, I see that her green t-shirt says, God has been so good to me. The letters are so bright and shiny. They feel like they're yelling. She puts her hand in front of me and I reach into my backpack to pull out the rest of the money I have left. The mystery guy at the diner paid for my food today, so why not? Have a blessed day, she says and smiles. Jesus loves you. He doesn't, but I smile back anyway. I look out the window and watch the skyline lit up by the evening sun. The buildings reflect a dazzling orange red and if you glance, it almost looks like the buildings are on fire. I bet the school has already called my parents and I'm in some deep shit again. It was worth it though. I open my journal to a blank page and write, God has been so good to me before I forget. Now that we've enjoyed those first three chapters of I am not your perfect Mexican daughter, let's go ahead and work on a personal connection. So what you all are going to do is on Schoology, you've already opened up the document that looks like this. So we're going to work on the section called Personal Connection. What in these first three chapters did you feel personally connected to? And so I, for this um, slide, put a picture of myself. I was literally 15 years old in this picture, which is exactly the age of Julia in this book. And um, I'm wearing my Raider sweatshirt and, um, you know, the shoes that were in style quote-unquote install at the time 
And I just remember um, being this age and feeling a lot like Julia feels in this um, in this book so far where she feels not really connected to her mom and really misunderstood. And a lot of times like just really wanting to feel um, like closeness and connection, but at the same time feeling like um, everything was kind of out of control and there was nothing I could really do to bring things under control. And now that I'm older, I kind of... Um, look at it like a lot of it has to do with the cultural idea that um you know children quote unquote children that your children are supposed to be seen and not heard and i think um at that age i already had a lot of ideas and a lot of ambitions and a lot of things i wanted to do and i wasn't really supported in that and so it caused me to be like um a lot like her just like a little um piñata waiting to explode for other reasons not the one she stated and so this picture to me really um, is a connection to the feeling that I have in this picture is really something that connects me a lot to the feelings that I got in reading about Julia. So um, you're going to go ahead and do the same. You're going to share um, your connection, your personal connection on, in this section of your document. Now, the next thing that you're going to do is an art connection. And so she talks about a lot of art in these first couple of um chapters she talks about you know various plays and books and characters that she feels connected to but when she goes to the art institute in chicago she she speaks specifically about this painting right here right the um the painting that julia loves in the museum called judith slaying holofernes um so from what you think about julia so far why do you think she loves this painting so much Okay, so I really want you to analyze that picture. I want you to analyze what you know about Julia. And you are going to write um, your response in this section here, the art literary connection. And then the other thing that you're going to do is you're going to um, analyze this picture. It's from a, a theater piece called um, Bernarda Alba. And she refers to this um, play in the chapters as well so um a scene from the play mentioned in i am not your perfect mexican daughter called bernarda alba what is the mood of this scene so i want you to really pay attention to the characters um their you know their physical distancing from one another um the way that you know they have their um, bodies positioned against one another the way that they're dressed and i really want you to respond to the mood of the scene and how that connects to i am not your perfect mexican daughter and what we know of julia so far now the last thing that you're going to do for these chapters is on the same document there's an area that says close read page 38 paragraph 3 you're going to go back to page 38, paragraph 3. You're going to reread it. You're going to do what they call a close read. And so it's the part that says, a green balloon floats past a power line, then gets tangled in a tree, and the rest of that paragraph. And you are going to answer these questions. Where did she get this idea of a balloon chasing her? What does being chased by this balloon tell you about Julia's desires and dreams? What dreams do you have for your own future? Thank you so much for enjoying these three chapters with me, and we'll see you tomorrow for chapters four through six.